I know it, it's been a long day and we um, put a lot in this, in this day, but um, this is, I think, a good, um, powerful concluding panel. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, who will take it from here. Uh, thank you for coming. I know it's been a long day, but I think this is going to be a really good panel. Um, so uh, to my left is Richard Kallenberg, who is sort of famously known for being a major advocate for class-based affirmative action, and he's recently co-authored a book advancing a new idea f for the labor movement um, to make labor organizing a civil right uh, which could hopefully deter employers more from squashing unionization efforts. Um, there is Rich Yeselson, a longtime labor researcher and strategic, strategic researcher who um, wrote an essay in 2013, which I'm sure many people in this room have read, called Fortress Unionism, which advanced a particular view of, of where the labor movement should go moving forward that I'm sure who will address. And uh, Mark Brenner, who is the director of Labor Notes, which is a um, media and organizing uh, website, rabble rousing, uh, will also probably bring a different point of view to the labor movement. Um, so we have a longer period of time for Q&A than in some others, so I, very, I really encourage everyone to submit questions. Uh, each of the panelists will talk, give their speeches, but we will have a lot of time for questions, and it's the end of the day. so as good of a time as any. Um, and my name is Rachel Cohen. I'm from the American Prospect. I don't know if I said that. OK. Um, we'll start with Richard. Okay. Thanks. Um, so my name's uh, Rick Collenberg. I'm a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. I've been to a lot of these progressive conferences. And when they go on for nine or 10 hours, there's a, a Darwinian process that uh, takes place. So I want to say that you are the special folks, the survivors. You know, and uh, Ralph Nader, who, um, who used to be a hero of mine, uh, used to give these four-hour speeches. Uh, and, and people would stream out of the audience after a while. But he didn't care, because those, those people at the end were the ones who, who mattered most. So. Um, Let's hope that's the, that's the case today. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, a new book that I wrote with uh, Moshe Marvit called Why Labor Organizing Should Be a Civil Right. We had some copies available. I think some of you may have picked up uh, those. And, and also there's a New York Times op-ed that, that summarizes our argument. Um, it, I think it comes comes down to this. The, uh, y you all may remember in President Obama's uh, second inaugural address, he had that, uh, that famous line about the success in, in Selma, Seneca Falls, uh, and Stonewall, right? So we're talking about the great uh, civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, and the gay rights movement. So who was missing? Right? Organized labor. Now maybe that's because there just wasn't an S that you could associate with organized labor, but I think it goes to something deeper, which is that labor has resisted uh, the association with individual rights that resonate so powerfully uh, with Americans in this country, whether we like it or not. I mean, I'm, I'm all for solidarity uh, and for collective action. That's why I'm here today. Um, but uh, I think that uh, we all should consider whether putting individual rights at the center of our efforts to strengthen labor and to, to address inequality might be a, a better option uh, than, than the traditional ones we've, um, we've been pursuing. So I want to make um, three sets of observations. The first two will be very quick because basically they've been made by other people um, th throughout the day. Uh, the first is that 
you know, I think we all here agree that labor is in deep trouble uh, and that new approaches are needed. The National Labor Relations Act is not protecting workers who want to try to uh, organize, uh, which helps explain labor's decline. Uh, you know, yes, globalization has a lot to do with the decline in labor, but we all know um, that in other countries, uh, as, as Elizabeth uh, Bunn noted, uh, in other countries, there are higher levels of union density, even though those countries are uh, facing the same globalization pressures, in part because they have better legal protections for workers who are trying to organize. Uh, the single most effective way to stop a uh, labor organizing uh, effort in its tracks is to fire some workers and scare uh, the rest of them. And uh, Freedom House says that U.S. labor is less free than 41 other nations, uh, in part because the remedies for um, uh, violating the NLRA, which does in technically prohibit firing workers, uh, are so weak. Uh, back pay and, and reinstatement. Um, it, it's been noted several times today that traditional labor law reform doesn't seem to have a lot of resonance in this country. So the four times when uh, all the stars were aligned, a Democratic president, Democratic House, Democratic Senate, uh, efforts going back to L Lyndon Johnson uh, at labor law reform have failed. So we need a, a new paradigm in, uh, in addressing this issue. Uh, second point is that, um, that the exciting alternatives to traditional labor unions that have been talked about today um, should supplement rather than supplant um, traditional labor organizing. And I think that's something that, that the folks who, who talked about the alternatives would also uh, generally agree with, that, um, that in addition to raising the minimum wage, passing domestic uh, worker bill of, bills of rights, in addition to the, the great efforts of, of working America, uh, we also need uh, strong labor unions. And that was, uh, was a point that was um, made on several occasions, that we need self-sustaining financial models uh, because all those other organizations, all those alternative organizations rely on foundations or on the labor movement itself. Um, okay, so third and last observation is, you know, if, if unions are necessary on the one hand, and if traditional labor law reform is unlikely to be successful uh, on the other. You know, what is to be done? And uh, Moshe Marvin and I argue that we should try to recapture the language of individual rights um, on behalf of labor, which, which isn't something that's normally done. Uh, we get killed politically uh, when we talk only about uh, collective action and solidarity. Americans believe profoundly in individual rights. Uh, that's why the deceptive rhetoric around right to work is so uh, powerful and resonant. Uh, obviously, groups on the left have used this in very uh, effectively in the last 50 years with, uh, with the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and the gay rights movement. Um, and so what Moshe and I argue, following the lead of, uh, of labor lawyer Tom Gagan, is that we should amend the Civil Rights Act, uh, which now protects people from being discriminated against based on race and sex and national origin, religion, and other categories, uh, and extend that to people trying to organize a union. Uh, and I think that does three things. The first is the Civil Rights Act has powerful uh, remedies for violations. When uh, an individual is discriminated against based on race or sex, uh, they are eligible for compensatory and punitive damages, uh, which is not something that's available under the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, importantly, they are also, they also get a day in court, which, uh, a day in federal court, which means the right to engage in dis legal discovery so you can depose the boss, uh, which is a powerful um, legal tool uh, that, that you know, some, some uh, employers would like to avoid and, and will settle as a result. 
Um, secondly, uh, the language of civil rights uh, are something that, that, that people can understand. They understand that you should have a right not to be fired for organizing and trying to become a member of the middle class. That's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, now, I'm a, you know, I support EFCA, but it is not simple. And you get distracted in all sorts of conversations about the secret ballot and whatnot. And, and so having a very clean message that civil rights, which have been so good for this country, should be expanded to anyone trying to organize a labor union, I think is something that people will understand um, and will, um, will be politically popular. Um, the third reason to want to do this is hopefully to change the culture in this country because it used to be uh, perfectly fine to discriminate uh, based on race. That was something that was considered acceptable in our society. And uh, through uh, changes in attitudes, but also through changes in law, we changed the culture. And, um, and I think that would, would be very important. If it became shameful for an employer to discriminate against someone trying to organize a union, because you have violated that individual's civil rights. Um, I think that, that could be powerful. So if you, you know, look at the trajectory of, of uh, American history in the last 50 years, you see uh, you know, an upward uh, progression in, in the rights of, of women and African Americans and uh, gay Americans, and you see a decline in, in labor uh, and an associated increase in economic inequality. So you have this, this scissors, um, and, and it seems to me that getting um, labor to be part of that upward trajectory uh, by connecting it to civil rights um, could be important. Now, people in, in labor circles I know get very nervous when, when one talks about individual rights because we are here because we believe in collective action. Um, and I just want to uh, emphasize that the whole reason to have uh, civil rights for workers would be to promote that collective, uh, that, uh, those collective goals. And, uh, and that's certainly been true of the civil rights movement. The fact that an individual can sue under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act to protect uh, her, her rights in no way means that uh, individuals can't also come together in marches uh, for, uh, in Ferguson or for Trayvon Martin or others. So, uh, so the two are not, uh, are not mutually exclusive. The one can reinforce the other. Uh, in July, uh, legislation was introduced by Congressman Keith Ellison and John Lewis um, uh, to support this idea of making labor organizing a civil right. Um, it's called the Employee Empowerment Act, and I was, was pleased that a number of civil rights groups and labor organizations have endorsed that legislation. Uh, it is unlikely to be high on the agenda of John Boehner, um, and I recognize that, which is why Moshe and I are now working with some state and local officials uh, an idea that, uh, that Harold Meyerson has talked about uh, in California in particular because uh, it is possible in, in certain blue states to make some progress and even some municipalities have, uh, many municipalities have civil rights legislation that you could add labor organizing to. There's, uh, there's a technical problem here. There's a, the Na National Labor Re Relations Act preempts state and local efforts um, for covered employees, but there are 25 million non-covered employees for whom we could start to build a movement around labor organizing as a civil right. Um, so uh, the idea here is to, to try to build some action at the state and local level so that when the stars are aligned once again and there's a Democratic uh, majority in the House and the Senate and Democratic president will be in a position to do something better. And I think that, uh, that this could be something more broadly that would excite young people uh, who miss the civil rights movement and want to be about something bigger than themselves. Uh, and so if this could be an, an idea around which uh, young people said, you know, we want to be part of a civil rights movement 
that will um, help bring back the American middle class, uh, then I think we'll have done something important. Thanks. Uh, next up will be Rich Yesselson. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Uh, whatever. I, I got my instructions. See, even the panels get smaller at this time of night. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, we're, you know, it's just even the survival of the panelists, you know, just hardy. A few of us. Um, so, yeah, so when I was thinking about uh, what to talk about here, you know, I started pulling out some old stuff to read. Uh, so this one is uh, from Nick Salvatore, the great uh, historian at Cornell. The decline of labor, a grim picture a few proposals. Well, you know, where's my Sinai tablet now? Um, so that's 1992, right, that Nick is writing this. And he does have one good proposal, which I'm going to get to, um, and which a lot of people have touched on here, which is almost even more important the smaller the labor movement gets. So I think broadly the task is to bring back, and this is a big task I think, to bring back a version of what used to be called the labor question. People know that, I mean there's a couple of actual ringers here, historians, they know, they know what the labor question is. Um, <clears throat> but the labor question was actually this huge deal. Um, which from like the late 19th century through about 1940, where like, you know, if you were running for president and, and if you could imagine there were televised debates then, which of course there weren't, people would ask you about the labor question. Like William Jennings Bryan ran three times. He talked about the labor question every time. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, when he gave his State of the Union, it was a message back then, they didn't actually go and talk. In 1919, the Congress said the question which stands at the front of all others is the question of, of labor. How are the men and women who do the daily labor at, uh, um, of the world to obtain progressive improvement? Uh, even, by, even in 47, which is already a little late, the beginning of his State of the Union address, which he did speak before Congress, the biggest domestic issue in 47 was labor management relations. The biggest foreign one was cold, was cold War, right? But number one, labor management relations. Of course, 10% of the uh, workforce of the United States had gone on strike in 1946. So that was kind of a, a big deal. That would be equivalent of like 14 million today in one year. So just wrap your head around that. So, right, maybe we can't bring back the labor question in all of its enormous magnitude when we talk about industrial democracy with great earnestness and we talk about the, the connection between working people and politics, economics, and even culture. You know, they had broad running like play on uh, Broadway, you know, I mean a long running play on Broadway, the pajama game, about a pajama factory that was unionized in the 1950s, right? I mean, stuff like that, you know, I mean we got Norma Ray, it's, you know, maybe we can bring all that back, maybe not. But sort of how do we at least keep that in our head? Like thinking about what is the relationship between working people and politics, the, at the economy, and culture? And see if we can bring that back in some way, because it was, it was a big deal for 70 years. So I want to ask that question and probably not answer it. But I, I, I next want to sort of say what we lost. Then the big misses that we had about 40 years ago, there are two I think. And then sort of why maybe things are slightly better now and you know, not so, I don't know, what this guy say, a grim picture. Maybe it's slight, slightly less grim per some of the discussion today, but still you know, a heavy lift. Um, so what was lost? I mean, we sort of all know it, like people sort of say it and sort of quickly move past it. Uh, globalization, the industrial, blah, 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 blah. No, that's like 50, 70 million workers worldwide, like in, in the advanced countries. And, and, I mean, you, you, you need to sort of, like, in a way it shouldn't depress us. It should be, we should be more like the five-year-old kids playing soccer, like everybody gets a medal for just, we're all good just to be pushing through this. I mean, 
this was the most powerful, you know, left-wing working-class force in, 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 in history. And it empowered working people all over the advanced world. And it's not just us. Like, everybody here has talked today about or the American labor movement and Reagan and PASCO, blah, 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 blah. The entire Western world, the labor movement has declined in the last 60 years. And by the way, it's not 30 years it's declined here. It's 60, all right, since the mid-50s. But it declined everywhere. When we were at 34%, the Brits were over 60% union density. Okay, now they're at 25. That's almost as big a decline. Germany, which has probably, arguably, the most powerful labor movement in, in the world, you know, 20 years ago, it was at a third union density. Now it's at 18%. I mean, the French, I mean, you know, the French, the, their contracts cover like 90%, which is, you know, obviously unthinkable to us. But actual members, it's only like 7% something. Spain is 7%. There's only five countries in the world that have over 50% union density, and four out of the five, they run the unemployment insurance levels for their, their, their un, un, unemployment insurance programs for their countries. So it's kind of like a, a captive market. Like, they're never going to decline that much, mostly the Scandinavian Navy and countries in Austria. So this was everybody with this decline. Everybody in the advanced world, because as Eric Hobsbawm, the great British Marxist historian, said, all these workers just disappeared. They retired. They went to, to uh, you know, developing countries. Their productivity increased, so there's less of them we need in the United States. So like in the early 70s, when you had like steel at 1.1 million members, you know, we, Gary Hubbard, oh, I guess he left, Gary Hubbard for the steel workers, you might know this. But, okay, so that's 1.1 million members driving the middle class, right? Um, along with the UAW. And yes, coded white male, we're talking about Manufacturing and mining workers, right? Just white men, default status, they don't have to think about their identity because they're white men, almost overwhelming, okay? But white men with a hell of a lot of power, and some of that power trickled out, okay? So think about 1.1 million in the early 70s, like the union for steel workers. They weren't all steel workers, most of them were, some were aluminum workers. So how many steel workers, union and non-union, like people who work in steel mills, do we have in the United States today? Anybody want to take a guess? Like 40 years later. 100 and, what? No, that, that's, uh, yeah, I guess I set it up so it would be incredibly low. <laughs> it is incredibly low, but it's not that incredibly low. 150,000, okay? The union itself had 1. million members. This is 150,000 union and non-union, and they're never coming back. So hold on to the idea of how much power was lost there, economic power and political power. Political power in the Democratic Party, and again, all over the West. Political power in all the labor parties of Western Europe um, and Canada. I mean, they're better than we are, but they went way down too uh, before they flattened out. So power is lost, but also institutional and historical consciousness is lost, okay? Um, so you think of like the mine workers. I mean, when John L. Lewis, for about 10 years, was the second most powerful man in the country, the reason, it wasn't because he was a nice man, he was like an incredible prick, right? Um, the, the, I mean, and, uh, Truman, like, hated, um, in fact, most, most of America, according to the polls back then, hated him. But the reason he was the second most powerful man in the country was because he had a union of 400,000 mine workers who controlled 65 to 70 percent of all the energy in the country. And he could just shut down, like, the lights, right? Well, now we have, like, 15,000 mine workers, maybe. And, of course, they're never coming back, and for good reason, for climate change. You know, it just can't have that. Sub-Saharan Africa needs coal. But aside from that, you know, you can't have mine workers anymore at, at these levels. Otherwise, we're just going to incinerate the planet. So, but we lost something with that. Everybody understood that mine workers and their communities well, absolutely solidarity, right? 100%. Um, and that conveyed a message to the country, you know, that these, yeah, mostly guys, but supported by their entire communities, would do 
anything to support each other. This is what social solidarity meant. And they're gone now. They can't, tell, they can't present that message to us anymore. So we have to rebuild that from scratch. So here's what we lost in two and a half minutes, and here's what we sort of need to gain. We had two big misses, right? And one of them was discussed earlier by, by uh, Leo, I think. Like, you know, CIO tries to organize the South uh, in 1947, gets killed, and puts a huge amount of resources in it for that time period. Like a million dollars, real money, 250 staff, best organizer in the CIO, gets killed. You know, it gets red baited, race baited, you know, too early, right? I mean, right, we can't pick our moment, as, as Joe McCartan said, but too early. Because what you needed to do, and this was totally freaking the South out for like 30 years, for 30 years, between the mid-30s and the mid-60s, and, and beyond, was combined labor and the African-American civil rights movement. Because so much of the power of white supremacy in the South had to do with like a wage, a wage system designed to like exploit and terrorize work, black and white workers and enrich southern bourbon elites. So if you combine them, if, if we could have figured out how to do that in the, in the early to mid-60s, then it wouldn't have been just maybe a civil rights bill and a voting rights act, which were incredible in themselves, but maybe a, a, a new labor, labor act too, maybe a, a new Wagner act. Because, but, we, but we missed it. And look, I mean, some, obviously some unions were very supportive, but we, you know, you weren't going to have somebody like George Meany pull that off. You weren't going to have basically the white man who ran the, the American labor movement sort of conceptualize that. That's tragic. Second time was the early 70s, okay? And, and think about why this happened, and this is why I'm slightly hopeful for today. Um, the early 70s, all kinds of incredible stuff happens. Like, I mean, a lot, a lot of, the, well, they, I guess the young people are hard here, so that's why they stuck around. Like, basically, 1970, I mean, there was like a postal strike. It was a wildcat strike of the postal service. Like, not, not announced by the leadership. We love the leadership. We talked about the leadership. We had leadership here earlier today. Is there any left? No, they're too smart for that. They, they, they went off to lead. But, but look, it was a wildcat strike. I mean, 200,000 postal workers. It starts in New York City. It spreads from city to city. People talk about, you know, whatever, Facebook. I, I mean, bless it, it's great. You know, Twitter. I don't know, you know, they didn't have that stuff. It spread. They said, fuck you, we were striking. I mean, Nixon had to bring out the National Guard. I mean, he didn't bust them the way Paco did because he thought he could, he could figure out a way, to get, a way to get to white workers. So he wanted to not, not bust them the way Reagan did with Paco. Um, but that's amazing, Wildcat strike. 400,000 GM strike workers go on strike in 70. In 72, Lordstown, Ohio, the fastest uh, uh, auto assembly line in, in, in the history of the world. Three-week strike costs uh, GM 150 million, which is even real money now. Um, J.P. Stevens, Farrah boycott, wrap up, okay? So we missed that too. We missed that because, but here's the hopeful thing. We missed it because basically a huge recession, 74, 75, and it breaks the back of the whole thing. It doesn't spread. But why was that hopeful for today? It's hopeful for today because those people, those workers who were, who were pissed off and striking in the early 70s, they came out of the 60s movements. They were Vietnam vets. They, 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 were, they were women who had become radicalized by feminism. They were African Americans who had become radicalized by the civil rights movement and the black power movement, okay? Those, just broader social movements connected with our labor movement and fed it. And sometimes it works that way and sometimes the other way, where, where workers feed into the broader social movement. And that's what we need to do today, and that's why I'm more hopeful. Because we see, as people have discussed, we see something sort of coming up, you know, post-Ferguson. And we see, you know, our, our $15 an hour minimum wage stuff and, and, and uh, you know, our retail work stuff. And we need to connect to people who are just generally pissed off about authority. And that's what happened in the 60s leading to 70 strikes. And when it happens, it happens big. We don't know how to spread it. If we did, you know, we, we, you know, we, we would. But that's what happened in 1877, railroad strike. They even have telephones. You know, 1876, the telephone invented, right? So there weren't any telephones, but it still spread. So it can happen today with all the 
social tool we have. So, I mean, I'm not saying it will, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and, and our final speaker sure. is Mark Brennan from LibreNotes. Um, I just wanted to first say thanks uh, to Leo and the uh, Albert Schenker Institute for inviting uh, me in particular and LibreNotes specifically as well to be part of this discussion. Uh, at least a half a dozen folks have come up to me since I've been here and uh, both mentioned their surprise and their encouragement that we're uh, talking. Uh, some cynics say desperate times call for desperate measures, but I'm just glad <laughs> we're in the conversation. Um, uh, Labor Notes, some of you know, has been uh, uh, accused sometimes of throwing bombs. Uh, I got a text from my mother today. We're from North Carolina, so she encouraged me to be on my best behavior. I will try. Um, uh, what I want to do uh, is first point out, um, I think over the day I've been really struck by how much uh, commonality and agreement there is in the room uh, on the need for the labor movement to really be a movement, to try and build a movement beyond just the workplace. Uh, you know, and something much broader than unions, uh, you know, building with our community alliances and our partners out there uh, in the rest of the world. Um, we also agree, like, we need to go well beyond our traditional jurisdictions, embrace non-traditional worker organizations, and uh, need to experiment. So um, I want to focus in my time, uh, my 11 minutes that I've got left here, on uh, some places where we maybe don't agree, or at least places I think after today we need to kind of clarify. Um, and, I, and I'm going to divide it into the, uh, what we need to do, the old left program question, if you will, and how we're going to do it, the new left process questions. Um, so stick with me for a little bit. Um, in terms of what we do, uh, just to clarify, I, I think it didn't get said enough. This is a, this is a fight for power. Uh, our movement is about building power for working people, and that means taking power away from people that have it. Uh, when we do classes at Labor Notes, uh, at, at our conferences about power, we're pretty clear. There's two kinds. There's organized money and organized people. Uh, we've got a lot of potential power in our movement for being organized people. Uh, but as we'll talk about in a minute, we're certainly far from uh, uh, that frontier of our potential. Uh, second thing that I think we have to be a lot clearer on is um, our need uh, as a movement to be raising expectations. Um, you know, we live in the richest country in the history of humankind. How is it that we uh, can talk about having a pension and, you know, four weeks paid vacation, and that's too much, right? We can't afford that. Somehow, the, the, you know, companies like Walmart can't even afford to pay, you know, $12, $15 an hour. Like, this is, uh, this is about trying to aim higher and raise people's expectations, uh, and our movement needs to be all about that. Um, and I think to do that, uh, we need to be trying to, we're trying to create a common sense. Uh, Karen Nussbaum was talking about uh, class consciousness, and there was a little discussion about that earlier. Uh, I, I like to call it common sense, and I think, um, just to pick up on what Rich said, the way we're going to do that primarily and best is through direct action. 1946, as he mentioned, there were 10 percent of the workforce that was on strike. Uh, that created a hell of a lot of common sense among people about what we were doing and where we were going as a country. Um, uh, what hasn't been said enough, and I think needs to get said some more, and we need to discuss and debate, uh, is we need to break some rules. Uh, you know, the labor laws that we have are set, to, you know, they're designed to, 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 to make us fail. Um, and if we're going to change them, I think it's going to involve a hell of a lot more uh, breaking of the rules that, as they exist. And so I'd like to talk some more about when and how we're going to be doing, be doing that. Um, uh, we talked a bit about it today, too, but I want to sharpen this question about the role of the public sector and public sector unions. Uh, I come out of the public sector, and I can tell you, um, for most of my time as a union activist and as a local leader, uh, my statewide leadership and to some extent my national leadership was terrified of the public. Like, we would do everything and anything we could to stay out of the spotlight, to keep our bargaining completely hidden in the dark, to keep the, 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 the state, the, the, the citizens of the state of Massachusetts, where I was a public sector worker, completely uh, in, the, in the dark about what we were doing. Uh, and I think that was a, a hellacious mistake, and I think it set us as the teachers union in the state up for a lot of the wrath that we've gotten and, and that Mary Catherine was talking about. Um, so I'd like to, you know, I, I mean, I think that those are some of the things that we need to be thinking about and sharpening in terms of our program. But I think actually the program piece is really where we have more agreement uh, than less in the room. And so I want to talk a little bit more about the, um, the process piece and how we do it. Um, before I go to that, I wanted to say, um, I, I wanted to give uh, props in some unlikely places, at least for some of you in the room. You may think it unlikely for me to say this. But I think that one of the things that 
we've seen inside of the labor movement uh, in various quarters is the, the recognition that if we're going to create a common sense uh, among working people, given the low numbers of, you know, the low union density that we have, we've really got to um, actually do a lot more to try and sow the seeds for a movement, whether it's SEIU embracing the fight for a fair economy or uh, the work that inside the CWA they've been doing to try and promote a, a, a you know, a kind of internal discussion and program on uh, the need for a democracy movement in America. Uh, these are these are unions that are kind of grappling with the question of how do we uh, create the sea in this country in which these ideas that we're talking about here in the room today can actually swim in, uh, and how do we plant the seeds for a future movement? So I wanted to say, you know, I think we're we're doing some of that work right, but there's also uh, a, some big questions that are are, are open there about um, how we do it that I think relate to how we do our day to day work as a union movement. Uh, and I want to sharpen some of that. So I was really excited this morning to hear the vice president of the AFL-CIO sit up here and say that in his opinion, we can't do anything that we're talking about here without having the members at the center of that. I was like, hells yes, this is great. I'm in the right place. So um, I couldn't agree more with what he's saying. I think we got to define that a little bit and get into it a little bit more. Um, because as Karen Nussbaum on the same panel raised, she said, uh, you know, this raises the question of democracy. Um, and, and I agree with her, but I want to sharpen both those a little bit more. Um, and with all due respect to Paul Booth and his contribution on the, the, the urgency of the need to organize the unorganized, I'm going to say our first and most important and most urgent task is to organize the already organized. Uh, we got 13 million members in our movement. This is our strongest resource. This is our, our, our best hope. And we ignore it every day at our peril. Um, I was taught that we want a one steward for every 10 members in our shops, right? That's 1.3 million cadre that we need to build. Last I checked, there's no union in this country that is actually there yet. So I really want to encourage us to be thinking hard about how we're going to actually go back and do that. And I think to do it actually means we have to do some things pretty dramatically different than we've been doing them. Uh, first, as I said, uh, I think we need to tackle this question that Karen Nussbaum raised about democracy because it's not just about paying dues and having a vote. Uh, it's actually about members in, in an authentic way really leading the organizations that they're a part of, meaning developing the strategies, making the plans. Uh, we at Labor Notes uh, wrote a book trying to outline how this looks called Democracy is Power. I can't go into all of that. But um, I think a friend of mine who is an activist in the teachers union in Los Angeles kind of captured it when he was saying we need to exponentially expand the number of members with the skills, the confidence, and the authority to go out and do things on behalf of the union. So that's sort of the, uh, the, the mental picture I have in my mind. Um, like I said, though, I think we also have to contend with, with our practices, in particular, you know, what staff and, and, and elected leaders do. Um, Paul Booth brought up this question of the organizing model versus the servicing model. And I actually think that, that that framework, that dichotomy, has really done us a disservice over the years. Because to me, I think that, um, in point of fact, there's three nodes in the, in the chain. There's, there's ser servicing, there's mobilizing, and there's organizing. And at least servicing and mobilizing can be done top down and they can be done bottom up. But organizing, for me, is actually about self-activity. It's about workers organizing uh, themselves and putting, putting plans in motion and doing things on their own. And I think that this raises the question that I actually uh, put on a card for Dan Schlederman about what's the role of staff um, and the infrastructure um, of the labor movement. What do we need to change if our goal is actually to create more self-activity of our members out there in the world? Um, I think, unfortunately, we have a lot of institutional p pessimism about what people are willing to do. Uh, and, you know, we talked a lot about the successes uh, after the right to work sneak attack in Michigan for AFSCME and the AFT, um, but we didn't say a lot about Wisconsin where both those unions and many, many others pretty much cut, cut and run because they, they, they assumed, and maybe quite rightly, that in the short term at least, they, they weren't going to be able to stick it out. Um, but I want to offer up some examples from, from my experience working with unionists in Wisconsin uh, that you can. Uh, in particular, I was just writing a story for Labor Notes about the Racine teachers, where 90% uh, of the teachers in the city of Racine voted to reauthorize their union. Uh, and they had a majority after the first five days, but they kept working um, because they treated it like a new organizing campaign. They had call lists, they had one-on-one -on -one meetings with everybody. They just spent a lot of time working with each other the way you should do in a well-organized workplace. Um, uh, uh, Bob Muellenkamp wrote an article a long time ago that many of you probably read called Organizing Never Stops. And I think this is the, the picture uh, that we've got to kind of hold in our head. 
Um, but if we're going to succeed in organizing the, organ the, the already organized, um, we got to meet them where they're at. And while I agree a thousand percent with the, the sentiment of the discussion today that we live lives that are, you know, 360 degrees, three-dimensional, we are not just, where, you know, our jobs, we, we, we live in community, um, we do spend 10, 12, 14 hours a day at work. And if the labor movement, that's the labor movement, can't actually uh, meet people uh, where they spend so much of their time in the workplace and make meaningful change for them in the workplace, I don't think we're going to get too far. Uh, and, I, you know, and I think it's not really an either or, it's a both and. And the CTU strike, which we wrote a book about called How to Jumpstart Your Union, if you haven't read it, you damn well should. Um, it is uh, a great illustration of how they did just that. Uh, you know, they were having a debate in the city of Chicago about the future public education for their town. Uh, they were talking about massive national education reform policies. But they were also fighting for the right to have books on the first day of class and to make sure that when it got over 85 degrees that there was air conditioning in every building. You know, these are things that teachers cared about and they fought for. Um, but, but they weren't disconnected from the bigger questions that animated, um, uh, that animate many of us and that animated the strike. Um, I'll also say that, you know, I don't think we're going to inspire a lot of people to take risks if we can't actually demonstrate some kind of power on the job. And I know that's a controversial statement, but perhaps in this, uh, in this room, but I don't, I, I believe that it's true. So, um, I don't believe that we've lost the power to, to do that. Um, I wanted to say, uh, we've talked a little bit about um, the strike off and on here. David Rolfe uh, said that our power is the power to disrupt. So I wanted to add my firm endorsement for uh, the fact that that's got to be a central piece of our strategy. Uh, and it can't just be symbolic power, right? It actually has to be about stopping economic activity, hurting companies in their pocketbooks. Uh, and in the best case, that looks like community and labor doing it together. I'm thinking about the 18-day bus driver strike in Burlington, Vermont, where riders and drivers were, were on the picket lines together, or the CTU strike. But even if you look at the um, Piston Automotive in Toledo or the berry pickers in Washington State, these are examples where people used old-fashioned tactics to do what needed to be done and actually uh, succeeded. Um, now, to do any of this, to actually really connect with members where they're at, to tackle the issue of democracy, that means that we've got to embrace the question of politics. And I mean politics inside of our institutions, not just the Koch brothers and Alex of the world. We have to talk about how we run our organizations, how we make decisions, how we spend our money. You know, and Karen Nussbaum said, you know, this can turn into a hot mess sometimes, but I think the alternative is way worse. Unions at their very best are schools for democracy, or at least they can be, and without it, I don't think we're going to make much headway in changing, uh, changing our consciousness, uh, which is so much a part of what we want to do. I'll just end with uh, um, two points. One is, um, if you think about the CTU strike, which I said we've written a lot about, um, I don't think four years before they had their strike, you could have imagined the membership of the CTU having a discussion about the question of educational apartheid in the city of Chicago. But the leaders in that union that were actually willing to trust, that given the same facts, same analysis, and actually, um, you know, built, having built the relationships that they built, that members in that local could get there. Um, I've been in the labor movement for 20 years. I've never been more excited about where we're going. Um, our wing, Labor Notes, the troublemaking wing of the labor movement, as I like to call it, uh, we've been growing by leaps and bounds, and I see a lot of potential. Um, I, I think we've got a lot of work to do. Everyone here will acknowledge that, you know, whether it's Mark Demonstein or Larry Hanley, you get elected, now what, right? Like, the distance between your model and your model are pretty big. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, I want to end with um, one last thought, which is, it struck me that we've been very comfortable um, in, uh, in, in response to Ferguson uh, the, with the way that this insurgent movement has challenged uh, our traditional civil rights institutions and our traditional civil rights leaders, uh, this young insurgent leadership emerging out of these movements. I'd like to see that same openness in the labor movement uh, and inside of our own organizations. Uh, so, you know, that's what Labor Notes has been doing for 35 years. We're going to keep doing it. I'm glad that we're now uh, here at the Albert Shanker Institute. We'll see uh, what we can do. Thank you. We have a lot of questions. Um, so I'm going to ask a question first. Uh, I, we've talked a lot, we've referenced a lot of sort of historical high points in the labor movement today when union density was much higher, where it's been higher. Um, and as Mark said, there seems to be, uh, at least in the speaker's agreement, that the labor movement needs to be really adopting this broader social justice direction. Um, we know, you know, the Chicago Teachers Union is a good example. Um, but obviously, 
part of that large union density was often made up with lots of people who were not in that camp and were just looking for something to pay dues and get a sort of social insurance kind of thing. Um, where do they fall into the direction? Are we looking to, if they, is the idea that with the right education and organizing, they will suddenly become social justice activists too, or is there an acknowledgement that many people who might be in unions might not want to be on the front lines for other justice fights that many of us in this room would want to be in? So how do you, where, where are those workers and what do you, like what role do they play in the future labor movement that, you know, there's a, there's a sort of uh, aura of consensus in this room, but I think um, there are lots of workers that might be in unions that aren't, uh, might necessarily not get on board with that. Well, I'll start off, I'll just say, you know, the, the, the changing demographics of the country uh, necessitates a changing uh, demographics of the labor union movement and and that makes I think the the uh, the broader appeal to social justice an easier sell uh, that is to say having more women in the labor movement more people of color um, enhances the chance that uh, the the law the larger social agenda will resonate uh, with those folks. Um, so I think, I think it, it, it's possible. Uh, let me just say that I think the, I mean, one appeal to the uh, idea of amending the Civil Rights Act to protect labor organizing is to try to uh, bridge these differences between groups. And, and uh, I mean, Leo, you talked about, let's, let's re reignite the, uh, the March on Washington from 1963. And that was the quintessential moment when civil rights groups and labor groups came together. Uh, we see it now in, in places like Canton, Mississippi, where the Nissan uh, plant is being organized by the UAW. And their whole theme uh, with the predominantly black workforce is labor rights as civil rights. Um, and so I think over time, the, the, the genuine problem that you've identified, Rachel, will become less salient. Um, there's, there's two ways to sort of break that down. Um, one way is, is to sort of confront what I think many people, especially activists by definition, find uh, disappointing is that oftentimes in the history of the American la labor movement, um, the fight, even at its most militant tactically, even at its most violent tactically, has been a fight for security. I mean, one of one of the guiding founders in, in whose shadow we give this conference. Um, you know, uh, this is sad. This is what happens when you get old. You can't remember the, the founder's name. Sidney Hillman. Oh. Uh, this is so sad. Anyway, you know, <laughs> it's, it's been 40 years reading labor history and you can't remember Sidney Hillman's name. Uh, Sid, Sidney Hillman gave like a famous talk in 1934 directed to the working class of America called like the, the quest for security or something like that, or the search for security. And there are gonna be a lot of workers, you know, a lot of union members who write, do think of it, do think of their union dues kind of like paying premiums for insurance. And the only answer about them is just, we have to, you know, the activists and the militants have to fight for the rights of those folks to like sit back in their lazy boys, which is what, you know, and watch the Super Bowl. I mean, because not everybody's going to be an activist and a militant. It's just, we're going to try, you know, we're going to, right, we're going to go one to 10. We're going to like try to pump up in, internal democracy. But there's never been a mass social movement in, in, in the history of modernity where everybody was fight the power, you know, all the time, you know. Um, you know, it's like Oscar Wilde didn't say, you know, the problem with socialism is, you know, too many meetings, you know. Um, so, <laughs> So we're gonna have to, they say he said it, but he really didn't say it, but such a great line. Um, <laughs> so that's one part, but the other part is what Rick, Rick talked about, which is when, when we talk about struggle today, and like when I was talking about like so those 1970s struggles coming out of the 60s, we're not using the default white male. What we have are two categories, like the political philosopher Nancy Frazier talks about, you know, the current of redistribution, and that one's pretty obvious. And then the other thing she talks about is the current of recognition, 
which I think some people are calling social justice day. And recognition is basically saying, I may be somewhat different than you in some sort of sociological category, but I'm a human being too, and I deserve full equality. And we have those, all those recognitional fights are not gonna go away now. It's not 1950. We're gonna keep making those fights at the same time we make the redistributional fight. Those two things have to be melded, and when you meld them, you get an injury to one is an injury to all, okay? So that's, that's so that, in that sense, I think we can do a lot. But there, there are gonna be people and they're lazy boys, you know? Don't, just, most of us are like them sometimes. I abused my time a little bit earlier, so I'm gonna be really brief. Um, I think that, I just wanted to say, for me, one of the things that's so critical about the, the union movement is it actually is a place for um, challenging uh, racism. And, you know, as a white guy from the South, whose grandfather was probably in the Klan, we think, um, you know, to be an anti-racist activist, to have the point of view that I have in the world, like that comes not by accident. It comes from the experience I had being part of movements and struggles that I got into from being in the, in the union movement. And I think that, that you know, you see much more modest versions of this looking at the way white union members vote versus the way the rest of the white population, particularly non-union you know, non white population votes. I mean, there are all kinds of indicators that our movement, particularly if we were a little bit more aggressive and um, uh, audacious, I might say, about tackling some of these bigger questions internally, um, could be really transformative. And I think we're at a point, as other people have said throughout the day, where we have a chance to do that. I was really loving listening to Jerry Hudson talk about the way that you've got security guards and prison guards and pol police officers in SEIU having to listen to other SEIU members talk about how does policing happen in our community. Like, I think that's the potential that we have because we actually have created a common space you know, we have create, we're trying to create a common experience for people. It's really powerful. We've, you know, I think we have a lot to learn from the Worker Center movement about being willing to talk about those kind of politics in our organizations and in, in our internal education. But I think that the, the moment is sort of here for us to really try and make some, some big steps. So um, I'll stop there. Um, so, well, I guess there's a couple questions about civil rights, but I'm gonna do that next. So the first, the first one is, uh, do you think it's important for SEIU and other unions to be reunited with other unions in the AFL-CIO? Mm. <laughs> uh, <y> yes. <laughs> I mean, sh sure. I mean, and I, and I say that just because we've tried, right, I mean, we tried transforming the AFL. Like, if you have a mass movement of workers, the organizations take care of themselves, you know? So the organizational sort of changing the chairs around. Um, if, if you're changing them around, as the old cliche goes, the Titanic, it doesn't really matter that much. So, you know, then we try to change to win. You know, I mean, so fine, yeah, sure. Sounds, sounds good. <laughs> We used to bet sometimes about like how many members could actually, of any of the affiliates of Change to Win, could name the national federation that they were part of. Um, and uh, I, I still hold out that I could make a lot of money in this crowd if you guys want to take that bet. Um, the, I, I, I think that the, the point to put a sharper um, uh, little moment on it than Rich just did is um, whether it was the Sweeney administration or the, the, the split in the AFL-CIO in 2005, um, we're not going to revitalize the labor movement from above. Um, that's the thing that we, we need to learn from this. You know, I agree with him that if the, you know, if we're actually building the movement from below, the, the organizations will sort themselves out. Um, so uh, I'm all for, I'm all for unity. Um, I, I think for most members, however, they don't really see what's the point of any of it. And, you know, that's, that speaks to the question of building the movement. Um, so the next question is for Rick. Uh, well, sort of two questions, so I'll just combine them. Um, could civil rights protections of labor activities be a double-edged sword? For example, could anti-union activists and their backers sue unions under the Civil Rights Act as a union-busting tool during uh, unionization, I can't read this, um, decertification fights? And um, also, uh, 
who are the workers that you envision being protected in this? Is it public sector workers? Is it all workers, including those not currently covered by the NLRA? Or so, just some more details on that. Yeah. So at the uh, at the federal level, it would be the covered workers under the NLRA. And then actually, I should clarify that the the Ellison Lewis bill doesn't quite go as far as Moshe and I would. Uh, they amend the National Labor Relations Act, but they use the protections of the Civil Rights Act uh, to, um, to make that change. The non, my reference to non-covered employees was if, if we are trying uh, at the state and local level to make change, um, which you know, for the foreseeable future, that's, that's where the action will be. It has to be at uh, the state and local level. Um, as to the question of whether this would be used by the, the right, I don't see how it, uh, at least the, the way we drafted the legislation, um, how it could be. I think, uh, you know, we already have the, the concept of, of uh, civil rights for workers employed by the right wing in um, the concept of, of right to work. And uh, so this is, is meant to recapture that notion on the left. I mean, when, you know, when Eleanor Roosevelt pushed for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, it had in it as a central plank uh, the right to join a union. We weren't then afraid to invoke uh, the individual rights on behalf of labor, and then it got distorted um, by the right wing. Um, just as a follow-up, because I saw another one. Does individual rights emphasis of, of the civil rights to join a union uh, require members only unions to be consistent? In other, I guess to rephrase that, does, does the model uh, seem to call for a members only union or? I don't think so. I mean, I don't think it needs to. Uh, Tom Gagan, who is, uh, is the one who originated this idea of labor organizing as a civil right, has recently come out for uh, members uh, only unions. and. And there is a, a consistent, going back to the last panel, I guess you could say there's a libertarian um, thread to both of those ideas, um, but, uh, but they, they, they aren't necessarily connected. Um, okay, so somebody sent this question. How should public unions prepare for the end of agency fees? I'd say, uh, do whatever they're doing in Racine, right? I mean, I think you want to engage members. We we haven't really invoked Al Shanker much here today. Since since I wrote a biography of him, I, I'll take the liberty of, of doing so. And, uh, you know, towards the end of his life, he was asked about, um, uh, you know, the growing movement towards, uh, uh, towards private school vouchers at the time and and said, well, you know, we'll, we'll go out and organize them as well. And I think, uh, I do think the public laws matter a lot and that we should fight for those things. But once, uh, once you have a loss, um, that doesn't mean it's the end of the game. And much can be done to, uh, to energize people and explain to them why uh, being part of the union is important. So I think, um, I think the efforts in, uh, in individual places in Wisconsin should be, um, should be replicated. I mean, think about, um, like, admittedly private sector, but think about the, the Culinary Union, Culinary 226 in Las Vegas. I mean, that's a right to work state. Um, they have, like, overwhelming compliance uh, to pay union dues because that, that those workers and anybody who's spent any time around them knows this, those workers are fully mobilized. They have a very strong sense of the power of their union. They have a very strong sense of, of, of their power, their individual power even, within the union um, to, make, to make their voice heard about, about collective bargaining. They have a sense of their power within that community, uh, which is the fastest growing city in the United States, or it was until a couple of years ago. So, I mean, when you lose deduction, you, you know, it, it, it cuts both ways, you know? I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's tough, and, but there's almost like a, a reactionary conservative argument that 
uh, and, and the left argument too, that sort of come together and say, say look, people self-empower themselves. They pay their dues knowing, knowing what, they, what, they, what they're getting. They take responsibility for doing that. And they consequently feel mobilized um, and, and, and more militant for doing that. Of course, the only problem is you just have to make sure they do it. Because if you lose, if you, if you can't get it together and they don't do it, then your union falls apart. But that's, that's the work. Uh, two things. One, um, I think before whatever shakes out with um, uh, the right for um, agency fee and the public sector, fair share in the public sector, um, before we get to that point, I, you know, as I said before, I, I think that one of the key things public sector unions need to really grapple with is how to get out of the sort of habit of being in the shadows and being afraid of the public. I mean, um, we need to be, you know, the most courageous watchdogs for the public good. And until we are seen as such, um, I think we're always going to be kind of caught in that vice of like taxpayers worrying about their mo how is their how are their money being spent and you know vulnerable to these arguments about, uh, you know, the cost of our pension or our, our pay packages. Um, I think that, uh, you know, for me, I just think a lot about the organizing that we've talked about over and over historically in the 30s and the 40s. This was not done with the level of union staff that we have now. So what, what is, the, you know, with far fewer communication tools or, you know, means at our disposal to get internally organized. So the, the hurdles are not insurmountable to uh, American workers. Uh, for us, it's really just about actually talking uh, about the need to do it and, um, and rethinking institutionally what the role of the staff will be in, in all this. Because I think that that's sort of in the bloodstream in such a way it doesn't even come out in these conversations sometimes. And that's why I'm pointedly trying to inject it a little bit. Because I think that, you know, we have not really built a movement that, it, you know, reflects you know, across the board, self-activity of working people. And that's, that's where we need to go, so. Um, real quick. Um, and if anything, public, you know, we talked all day about, you know, expanding the message, you know, incorporating the largest possible movement well beyond any given workplace fight, well beyond any given union. That, and that's for very good structural and historical reasons. That's true. But if anything, that applies double for public sector unions. Because, yeah, the, the, the taxpayers are paying the salaries of the union members and the union staff. And now that the taxpayers themselves only have 6.7% union density, they don't kind of get the union thing in the way that they did when, yeah, it was at one third, which meant that either, you know, in, in large parts of the country, like even place like Alabama had 18% density in 1950, which would make it as high as uh, Michigan today. But it meant like if it, at one third, it was like you were in a union, you know, somebody in your family was or somebody down the street was. So public sector unions really have to expand that fight, like we heard about in St. Paul. Um, oh, you got one already. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Jeannie Kemble or Phil Kugler will remember this story better than I do, but there, in, the New, in New York, uh, one, when, when Al Shanker took the uh, union on strike, and, you know, he was jailed, but also there was a punishment um, where the, the union could no longer have automatic uh, dues checkoff, and, and there's a story I remember about uh, the grassroots efforts that were put into place and, and the, you know, the checks rolling in. So, um, so these obstacles are, are real, but, uh, but, but they can be, can be overcome. Can I, I wanna uh, sort of follow up on this because um, I, I'm curious sort of, I totally think the idea of pushing public sector unions to be more transparent sort of uh, guardians of the public is, is a good idea. How do you envision um, like e taking that into account in the future fights over, you know, wages are stagnant, people are worried they won't have any uh, retirement for themselves, um, sort of these post-employment healthcare benefits are sort of a very ripe target uh, for political fights coming up. Um, how, how is the labor movement, can the labor movement um, be thinking about 
defending them or talking about them if they should be, because there's definitely going to be more Scott Walkers who sort of seek to stoke that sort of understandable resentment that I don't even think I'm going to have any health care when I'm you know, retired and I'm paying for these people's. See, I've never understood that. That seems, that seems like the best argument for private sector unions. You know, if, if the public sector, which is highly unionized, has decent uh, benefits and, uh, you know, the answer isn't let's take it away from them, but rather uh, that should be a powerful argument in favor of unionizing in the, in the private sector so that, you know, you too can enjoy these, uh, these benefits that were once broadly shared. I just want to tell a story um, from Chicago. Uh, it comes up; a, it's come up a lot. But since um, you know we're Shea AFT, let's let's talk about any, a really powerful AFT local. Um, the fourth day of the Chicago Teachers Union strike, there was a poll done in the city of Chicago. Fifty-five percent of the city residents and sixty-six percent of public school parents supported the teachers. This is on the fourth day of a strike that has shut down the whole city. Now, how the hell did they do that? Well, it was clear because, uh, you know, to me, it, what that made clear was that if you ask the people in the city of Chicago, who's fighting for our kids, who's, in, who's got the interests of our children and our public schools at, at, at their heart, it's, is it Rom or is it the teachers union? The people understood it was the teachers union. And I think uh, what they did to get there uh, is actually really more important because they weren't just talking about the issues and you know focused on what's the message how do we frame these things I mean certainly they thought a lot about well how do we talk to the public about our pensions how do we talk to the public about um, you know things like these credit default swaps um, but they didn't see it as a PR problem they saw it as an activity deficit they spent two years leading into the strike you know occupying a Cadillac dealership saying this this you know this you know, Escalade vendor here has gotten $3 million in TIF money from the city of Chicago. That's money that should be, uh, you know, putting a library in my school. They were, you know, uh, uh, doing sit-ins at the Bank of America and grade-ins, you know, in, in bank lobbies over uh, these exact problems. They essentially took these big questions that uh, Joe McCartan talked about bringing to the bargaining table, and they actually made them things that they were fighting for day in, day out through activity. Um, and, and I think you know, in the same way that the Republic Windows sit-down strike really crystallized for some people how, uh, you know, like nobody knew what the Warren Act was. And a friend of mine who was organizing home care workers in Chicago said two weeks after this, the, the, the factory occupation, like these home care workers who, had, who were owed back wages were in McDonald's writing, you know, signs about how they deserve their Warren pay and they were going to go down to their home care agency and, and pick it. You know, I think that's the thing that, that, that that activity really inspired, and I think that's the stuff that we need to start thinking about, uh, you know, how do we do more of as public sector unions. Okay. Uh, well, I was told to wrap up after that question. Um, so, uh, do you want to speak? Okay. So, thank you. Great panel. <laughs>
um, we think it might be interesting to put together a couple of writing groups that would be um, of the labor movement without um, being um, officially part of the labor movement in the sense that you would have to get official approval for ideas. Um, so, you know, something that, for example, um, the Shanker Institute um, and, and perhaps um, some of our other partners could sponsor, um, where we had some futures discussions. Um, um, the futures of what um, organizing in the American labor movement might look like, trying to en envision that. Um, and some futures discussion on organization. Um, there's a lot of things that we haven't discussed here today. It, it may seem hard to imagine at the end of this day that there's things we actually <laughs> didn't discuss. Um, um, but, but certainly, you know, I mean, there, there are questions about organization and, and whether our, the way that we organize ourselves is optimal, whether we should be, you know, trying to envision different ways to organize ourselves. We, we haven't discussed really at all today, for example, um, questions of international solidarity, and I think you can make a very powerful argument that um, one of the causes of the decline of um, the American union movement, and that for that matter, the union movement throughout the West um, has been the inability to have strong independent union movements in places like China um, and other countries where American corporations have fled over the last um, 30 years. So there's a lot of things that we haven't discussed. Um, you know, we're certainly um, open to the idea of having um, future conferences if they have purpose. Um, we're not, um, we're not, in, in a kind of ritualistic mode of having conferences for conferences sake, but if we can figure out constructive um, uh, purposes to them, um, we're certainly open to doing that. Um, and so um, we would love to hear your thoughts on that and, um, and you know, what you think, um, you know, you, you would like to see and, and even if there's stuff that you might want to be involved in. So um, two uh, last um, pieces of information. The first is how to get to the reception. So if you walk out here and take this ramp, if you wish, um, to, to our, let me get my, my directions right now, to our right, um, it will lead you into actually the lobby of the AFT building where our elevators are and you can just take the elevators up to the ninth floor where the reception um, will be. And um, you are all welcome and um, we'd love um, to share a little, um, a, a little fellowship um, at the end of this long day. And um, the last little piece is um, that um, members of the United Association for Labor Education, um, Cheryl Tier, who chaired one of our panels, is their president. Um, um, we're involved in sending out notices and bringing people um, to the conference, and that a bunch of the people who are here would like to take their picture underneath our banner. So um, when um, we're all finished, you can come up here front. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope the day was um, as informative and interesting and thought-provoking um, for you um, as it was for us. Um, good day.